So first things first, Joey, can you like introduce yourself for the audience, the coaches, the therapists in Taiwan? Yes. So my name is Joey Graney. I'm a strength and conditioning coach with the Major League Tampa Bay Rays. I'm going on my seventh season at the Major League level. And I spent uh, nine nine seasons at the Minor League level with the Kansas City Royals. Nice. So basically all like uh, baseball, right? Yeah. So um, pretty much been in professional baseball. This is my 16th season. Um, prior to that, I worked at a performance facility called uh, Velocity Sports Performance, uh, United States, um, in New Jersey. Um, and I worked there for a few months before uh, taking a, uh, a position with Kansas City in 2008. Um, and I kind of worked my way way up the up the levels of uh, rookie ball, A ball, double AA, A, triple A, and uh, to the major leagues. Nice. There's a lot of like great coaches come out uh, from Velocity, am I right? I think Rick Larson and Exos, like Victor Hawk, all all comes from like Velocity. Yeah, so uh, Lauren Seagrave um, started Velocity Sports Performance, world-renowned speed coach. Um, and then from there, um, uh, many coaches have br branched off and uh, – you know, started their own uh, performance uh, facilities. Nice. So how's life in like the pro setting? So professional sports is, is very unique. It's very different. Uh, you work with uh, players from all over the world, uh, of all different backgrounds, different cultures. Um, and, you, you know, in the professional world, you're with these, with these players, um, you know, all day. Uh, you know, we're traveling together we're in the hotels, the bus, the planes, uh, on the field, in the weight room. Um, so you kind of get to know these players um, on and off the field. Um, and it's, uh, you know, can be challenging at times, uh, but it's uh, very rewarding. Uh, I've met a lot of great coaches, a lot of great players from all over the world and uh, many who I still keep in contact with today. Love that, love that, love that. So the first thing I want to ask is that you post a lot of like speed training on your Instagram. So uh, as a uh, as a baseball performance coach, why do you think like sprinting or like speed training is like important for like baseball players? Yeah, so speed uh, as far as overall athletics and including baseball is probably the most important skill that uh, an athlete can have um, from a performance standpoint, but also from an injury reduction standpoint, uh, training speed is very important, both off season and in season. Um, how you go about it in the off season and in season is very different. Uh, but, but speed is one of those components that's it's game changing. Um, and you need, uh, you know, you need lateral speed. You also need, uh, you know, uh, linear and you need a uh, curvy linear speed and it, it needs to be trained as a skill. Nice, nice, nice. So like uh, American football players, they train speed. They need to like test their 40 yard dash, like sprinter, they train speed. So for baseball, how like how detailed should we be like teaching our baseball athlete for like speed training? How like how detailed should it be? Yeah, so uh, for baseball players, focusing on acceleration and top edge speed is probably where you're going to spend most of your time. As far as running mechanics uh, in baseball, it's it's very different because you got to turn a lot. Um, you know, you turn around first, second, third. So just focusing on that acceleration, the fifteen to twenty yards, uh, and being consistent at that. So uh, doing uh, resisted sprinting, hill sprinting, um, half kneeling, both forward and lateral sprints. And we include uh, just face down starts. And then you can add in the reaction component where the coach stands behind the players and just claps their hands and says, go. And those guys got to pop out and accelerate. Uh, it's easy to do uh, in season. You can do it with team stretch and you only need a few repetitions. But uh, the, the key is to be consistent with it. Um, so focusing on both the acceleration phase and the top end speed 
uh, especially for uh, hamstring health. I think exposing these players to um, uh, high, high speed sprints is, is very important. Um, in at the major league level, we have uh, Statcast. So uh, Statcast is running every single game. So we'll get a we'll get a report um, every night of the players' uh, sprint speed uh, and which players have not hit ninety uh, percent of their top speed in within that week. Those players that have not been exposed to high speed sprints, we can bring them out um, prior to the day and do some flying sprints with them. Uh, typically we'll build up or do a flying sprint for 30 yards. And then we hit a top end speed or an acceleration sprint for the, for the, uh, for 20 yards. Um, so we don't, we don't like our guys going more than more than five days without being exposed to, to uh, a top speed sprint. Oh, so, um, I, I, I noticed. Correct me if I'm if if I'm wrong, but I've noticed that like uh, is it major league had major league has their like combine like recently like did it start from last year or uh, two years ago? Yeah, it's it's about two years now that they have a uh, they have a combine performance combine with uh, with uh, young draft picks that they bring mm -hmm. in. Um, so it's still in the early uh, phase, phases of developing it, but so far it's it's been taken off pretty good. So did they like? Can you like give us like a clue about like what did, what kind of like uh like what did they do the test? Like, yeah, what kind of test? So um, oh, okay. So it's still in its early stages. Uh, some of the performance testing that they perform would be a uh, 10 yard burst, uh, five, 10, five agility, um, a 60 yard sprint. Um, and then there's some other um, testing. Uh, I think it's like a Y balance test. Um, they're doing height, we are doing weight, they're doing reach grip. Uh, so it's a battery of, of uh, different performance tests that they're doing. They're doing the vert jump. Uh, broad jump so they're getting uh, many measurements on some of these young uh, prospects so did that like is it going to change how like how you like assess those players which like how are you going to train the player or basically it's not not going to change anything um from our standpoint uh until they get into the organization and we do our own testing on them uh, then it will then it will change. Uh, so once these players come in to our organization, we run them through our own battery of tests uh, with our sports science department, um, and then we adjust uh, the players' programming from there. We can either uh, plug in certain movements to each player's program and uh, track them over time. Nice, nice. So can you like? Give us some clue about like what kind of tests you guys do. Yeah, so uh, this spring training, some of our performance tests that we did, we did a Nordic hamstring test. We did a force plate jump test, uh, hip uh, internal external rotation, shoulder internal external rotation, thoracic mobility test um, uh, on the performance side. Uh, from those assessments, we sit down with our sports science team uh, and we determine uh, which guys need need more help and what exercise are we going to plug in to combat uh, their uh, deficiency. Nice, nice. So I noticed that in the major league, like the schedule is like really crazy. Like they basically have to... Like they basically have to play like every other night, right? Am I right? And for a long, for a long period of time. So I noticed that, uh, in basketball there's like game day lift. In like hockey, there's they train like basic, basically like every day. Uh, what about you guys? How did you like, uh, microdose like, uh, strength training or like performance training in your like schedule? Yeah, uh, you know, baseball is a very unique sport, and at the professional level, it's it uh, even gets more challenging. 
uh, especially with the amount of travel games played, like you said, uh, the, uh, uh, the environment, the intensity, uh, the stresses that just the game alone plays, uh, you know, a role in their performance, um, and time zone changes. Um, you know, we do play every day. Uh, you know, we, we could play, end up playing 12, 15 games straight. Okay. That's, that's pretty common. Um, so from then it, you're, you know, in season, it's, it's about monitoring, um, uh, and, uh, and, and adjust and adjust the players programming, uh, uh, monitoring their fatigue, um, and, and just managing strength and power levels throughout the season, keeping guys motivated. And the biggest thing, like you said, is, is consistency. The biggest, the biggest thing that we can do during the season is micro dose their training, be consistent, address certain areas of need from a flexibility or mobility standpoint. Uh, but the biggest thing is consistent training, exposing them to strength training, exposing them to a little bit of explosive training, give them what they need, get them in the weight room, 20 to 30 minutes max, get them out. Um, these guys have a lot of other things going on. They're going to the batting cage. They're doing uh, work in the pitching lab. They're working with our mental performance team. Uh, they're sitting with our nutrition team, sports science. They could possibly do an interviews or commercials or anything from the media department. So, you know, we like to get our, our hands and eyes on it for 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day um, and address some uh, areas of need. Cool. So uh, for those like 20 to 30 minutes, how is that? Like how exactly is the process? Yeah. So the player will come into the weight room. We'll probably hit them with some foam rolling, um, perform a, a little bit of mobility, some activation movements, We'll get them on the uh, jump mat or force plate, um, have them perform a series of jumps to kind of see their readiness for the day. And then we'll go into our workout. Workout is broken up. We have three different workouts at this time. Um, there'll be a uh, workout. One could be, uh, it will include like a squat movement, uh, probably supersetted with a jump and then a core exercise. So there's three exercises in that first block. Um, then they'll come down and they'll do an upper body push pull with an upper body mobility built right into that program. And then from there, they'll go into a, probably a hamstring or a hinge type of movement or a single leg movement. Um, and then another upper body, usually it's a vertical pull at that point. And then we hit them with another core exercise uh, at this time. So it's there's three blocks with three exercises. Uh, the first block is usually three sets, uh, three or four sets of between three and five reps. Uh, the second and third block uh, is usually about two sets. Um, and then we'll hit them, hit them with a probably hip quad flexibility and send them on their way. So it's basically, it's a, it's a very simple uh, plan. Um, and then from, from that, um, if a player needs extra attention, we can we can either hit them with with that uh, with those exercises before or after that workout, and that usually takes about anywhere from three to five minutes of uh, any extra mobility or flexibility or uh, could possibly a, a, a different strength movement to address certain areas. Nice, appreciate that. So uh, next thing I want to ask is from your Instagram, and a topic I really find that interesting. Is like the rapid eccentric isometric. So, can you like give us like some of your thoughts on about like rapid eccentric isometric, and how would you program it into like baseball performance training? Yeah. So, if you look at sport altogether, there's a lot of rapid eccentric movements um, and isometrics, um, and the way we try to program this is mostly in the off season with guys prior to arriving to spring training, kind of just get them, get their, their body used to their muscles used to rapidly decelerating um, some resistance and then have to stabilize it in that isometric contraction. Um, it's a, it's advanced training strategy uh, as far as uh, isometrics, uh, eccentrics, rapid eccentrics and rapid eccentric isometrics. Uh, so those are all advanced training strategies. Um, we like to include that in our hamstring protocols 
Uh, we like to start guys out with the, on the Nord board with uh, Nordic ISO 60s, get them into full Nordics, um, and then perform basic eccentrics, basic isometrics. Then at the t- at the end, our level three hamstring protocol is the rapid eccentric isometrics like you're talking about. Uh, so we'll plug those guys in. If guys need extra uh, hamstring work, uh, if they're deficient on one side, um, then we'll we'll pull that. We'll address those areas before the workout or after, and we'll hit them with more uh, or injury prone guys, guys that have uh, injury history of hamstrings. We'll we'll start including some rapid eccentric isometrics, and it doesn't take much two to three sets of three to five rep- repetitions with about a three second pause. Um, so we like to include those in, but if you look at sport altogether, uh, that's it's very important. It's an advanced training strategy. Um, so you just kind of you have to progress players into that movement. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely a change on your on your skeletal muscle system. So is it do you only use it for like hamstring or like like the video post on Instagram, like basically whole body? Yeah, you can use it for the whole body. Um, what we like to do is pick and choose where we're going to use that. We wouldn't just completely do a whole workout with rapid eccentric isos, maybe one to three exercises in that workout. Um, it works good for upper body for the uh, for like dumbbell pressing. Rapidly decelerate that weight and pause, and then explode up. Uh, you can do it with split squats um, and and uh hamstring exercises i found work the best nice so uh another question from like rapid iso rapid eccentric isometric is you mentioned that you use it like during the off season so why during the off season instead of like in season yeah well with the amount of games the amount of volume that these guys are doing um and they, and they are exposing their hamstrings to to uh, top speeds um, when they're sprinting. So, you know, at, th- at this point in the season, it's you know, we try to find, okay, why will we continue to fill their bucket with rapid eccentric and explosive work? Um, you know, I think, you know, during the season, it's more about, like I said, managing those uh, strength and power levels. So, feeding their buck with a little more strength training because they're doing a lot of explosive work already on the field. Um, whereas in the off season, the amount of baseball activity is very low. Um, so that is a very good time to expose these players and their, and their muscles to some rapid eccentric type of work. Nice. So, uh, during this, like during the season, is there like, any 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 like tests you would do for like uh, monitor athletes fatigue yeah <clears throat> so during the season <clears throat> we'll ex- we'll jump guys on the uh, swift jump mat pretty consistently pretty much every time they come into the weight room and work out uh, and we'll be able to track their uh their their jumps uh either jump height over time or at RSI over time um we do do Nordic testing quite often, at least once a week. Um, we use the uh, gym aware unit for velocity based training. So if we want certain guys to be in a strength zone or, or a speed zone uh, when performing certain exercises, we'll have that feedback right away. Um, and uh, we'll do hydration testing also on our starting lineup through our nutrition team. We'll do that. Um, and then our uh, biomechanists will also perform some additional testing with players throughout the week on uh, shoulder internal external rotation, hip internal external rotation. Um, so if anything is trying to catch <clears throat> anything before uh, before any risk before it becomes a big problem. Yeah, nice. So uh, I noticed that. Uh... In your Instagram, you post a lot, a lot of like a uh, sp- split squat or like single leg squat instead of like a uh, bilateral bilateral squat. Why do you like post 
a lot of like single leg workout. Yeah. And I do like bilateral squatting, uh, but I found for most athletes for what they need to play a sport at a professional level, we have to remember that's their, that's their profession. That's their job. I found that unilateral training tends to work best, uh, especially in this in season. Uh, it's, you know, guys that, you know, especially when you're dealing with older athletes, older athletes tend to have uh, a little, a little more of an injury history, um, low back, knees, hips. And, and I found doing more unilateral um, main movements with them. They feel a little better when they leave the weight room. And, and, and that's what we want. We want them to go out and compete and feel good competing. However, we will do, we will mix in bilateral movements, but more of a lower intensity and more of a hypertrophy type of effect within the workout. Uh, for example, so if we had a player doing rear foot elevated split squats and they were going pretty heavy with that and they perform an explosive bilateral jump later in the workout, towards the end of the workout, maybe we hit them with like a goblet squat on a slant board and we kind of burn their, burn their quads out a little bit of uh, three sets of 12, three sets of 15, just so we can expose them a little more volume. Yeah, so instead of like, it, it's probably not the main workout. It's probably, probably more of a accessory for the bilateral. Am I right? Yeah, it'd be an accessory movement for the bilateral, bilateral movement. But um, keep in mind also, we do have some players that perform bilateral back squats with great with great movement, a good amount of weight. Uh, so again, you have to pick and choose, you know, the right movement for that particular player at that particular time. Nice. So, uh, how exactly, or how have you you usually like load your athlete with the uh, single leg squats? We'll load them pretty good. Um, you know, we like to st in season stay around four four sets of three or three sets of four. Uh, we'll kind of unload them. Uh, here and there throughout the season, um, roughly between that 85 to 95 percent range. Um, and as far as gripping, we 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 don't really want our players gripping like 90 90 pound dumbbells or 100 pound dumbbells. So what we'll do is we'll just put a vest on them and then grip some dumbbells. Or we like using the uh, the chambered squat bar, uh, the safety squat bar, and we can load that pretty good. Uh, we'll even add in some. Uh, 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 hand supported uh, variations of the uh, reverse lunge or rear foot elevated split squat. Cool. So, uh, in a baseball setting, there's probably it's not going to be like basketball where there's like only like probably twelve to like fifteen people. In baseball, it's larger. It's a larger group. So, how exactly do you like uh, monitor? Or like keeping track with like each and every athletes. Yeah, so it it it, it gets difficult, especially in spring training. We could have a weight room full of, you know, forty to fifty guys at one time. Uh, we will have additional uh, coaches during during that time in spring training. Um, we I like to use Excel, uh, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it's it's split up so I can see a huge a screenshot of one week um and within that uh spreadsheet i'll have symbols um for each workouts for each conditioning session for each speed session plyometrics core um and then it's also color coded based on when they pitch uh green cells mean they they pitched in the game a yellow cell means they threw a bullpen uh, uh an orange cell could be their live bp uh, during spring um, and it gives me a screenshot when I can sit when I sit at the computer it helps me plan for the day uh, and then as far as tracking a lot uh, all of our information gets entered into a program called Smartabase uh, and that's able to track players workload over time uh, throughout the course of the season um, so we kind of use a, a number of, of different strategies but I, I do like that Excel as far as uh, planning purposes for each individual uh, player. So we have 26 guys on the team. I can sit right down at the screen 
and I can I can plan out their week. I know when we're traveling, when we have day games, when we have night games, when we have a uh, double header, when we have off days. So it's easy to plan and manage. Uh, and then also communicate that information over to the player too. So they have, they know. Yeah. So <clears throat> for baseball, the sport demands a lot different with like uh, football or like basketball. So for like con for training, for conditioning, how would you program conditioning or like energy system for like your baseball players? Yeah. So the position players, uh, not so much. They're getting their conditioning during the game, running on and off the field, you know, playing every day. Uh, with the pitchers, we'll condition them about four to five times a week. Uh, we'll do different tempo running. We'll do a, a, shirt, a shuttle variation, so there's some change of direction in there. We may perform some agility movements, a little, you know, some different drills with change of direction. Uh, we'll do different uh, sprint workouts with them. Um, we'll do an indoor day where they're doing high intensity training, either on like the assault bike uh, or the slide board, expose their uh, uh, adductors to some stress. Um, and we'll do that mostly at home because Tropicana Field has a, is turf and some of the guys don't like running on the turf. So we'll, we'll do more indoor conditioning with them there. Um, but when we do travel, when we get out on grass, we open guys up, we'll perform different tempo running, um, at Tropicana Field also, it's a dome, so it's always 72 degrees in there. <clears throat> we want to expose our guys to the heat and humidity, so we'll take them outside Tropicana Field and run them on a, a little ramp. It's an incline, so we'll do some incline sprints with them um, outside, and then we'll, we'll, we'll gauge and adjust the running based on the schedule. If we travel into a city, maybe that first day, okay, we'll do some short explosive sprints. Maybe day two, we'll extend them a little bit, and we'll do a little bit of tempo run. And then day games, we're like, okay, you know what? Let's break out the footballs and we'll throw them some football passes. So they're getting some athletic movements, some deceleration work, some jumping, uh, and it's and it's uh, elevating their heart rate too. And it's fun to do. So guys like that. That's kind of how nice. we split up the conditioning. Nice, nice, nice. So uh, working in the major league and as a uh, strength and conditioning coach, there's pro it's probably like – a dream for a lot of like young strength coaches. So do you have like any advice for or suggestion for like those young coaches out there who want to go into like the pro setting? Yeah. So if you're looking to get into professional sports, um, you know, you just, you want to be content where you're at, uh, meaning where you are, just focus on doing a good job, you know, love the team that you're with, um, you know, be, be humble, um, you know, be, you know, show humil humility to your players, develop trust with your players, communicate with your players, uh, be reliable, uh, and just practice good coaching habits. And, and you'll, you'll eventually do a good job. People will notice and you'll gradually mm -hmm. Uh, work yourself up um, but but no matter what level you're at if you're an amateur professional you got to focus on being a good coach and I think it starts with those uh, those simple those simple tasks you know I love the approach I talk with a lot of like a lot of like coaches who work in like pro setting they always talk about like uh, you have to like have a good relationship with the players you have to value the players i really love like the approach with these coaches and with you when you talk about how you program the the training session with like the the athletes or like with no matter it's like baseball or like basketball i really love the approach yeah and it's important and it's important to remember to fit the exercise to the athlete not the athlete to the exercise so it's like you have a plan for this player when they come into the weight room, but then you got to take into account, okay, this player might have just pitched, you know, seven innings. It was 95 degrees yesterday. Okay. You always got to make adjustments. Okay. And, and it's just always important to remember um, at the amateur level and the professional level is you may have a plan, but you might have, you might have to rip that plan up 
and create another one quickly. Yeah, that's true, man. That's so true. I love that. I before I work with athletes, I always thought that I have a like before the first session of the year, I have a whole year planned out. And after the first session, I kind of like no, I'm 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 just gonna like do it like session by session. You have to like you have to like adapt to the athlete. They're probably just too fatigued to lift. Like they're probably too fatigued to do like max strength. You probably have to do like something like recover for probably do something like recovery for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you have a goal in mind. You what you know what stresses you want to ex- expose this player to, but there's a variety of different ways you can do that, uh, and that's where the the art of coaching comes in. The creativity comes in. Um, and like you said, the relationship and the trust building between coach and player, uh, comes in and, uh, you know, you work together, adjust their program. And the, the biggest things have them leaving that weight room, feeling good, ready to perform. Nice, nice, nice. For, for, so for all those years in the pro setting, uh, do you have like anything you want? If, do, if you had a chance to talk with like, let's say 10 years, like, talk to you like 10 years ago, what would you say to him? To myself? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, slow down. Um, you know, just be, just be consistent. Um, you know, just be content where you're at and be content with just doing a good job of where you're at. Uh, you know, and you know, there you know there is a plan. Just focus on where you're at. Work with athletes, get them better, get them stronger, more explosive, and then kind of just let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, love that, love that, love that, man. So uh, that's kind of like probably that's probably all the question I have for today. So if those like coaches and therapists are interested in what we're talking about today. Or they want to like reach out to you. Where can they find you? Yeah, they can just reach out to me on uh, Instagram at uh, Joey Graney, J O E Y G R E A N Y, and shoot me a message there, and I'll be more than happy to to talk uh, performance training or um, therapy or anything. Yeah, love that, love that. 